Hello everyone, I am Courtney McGrath from the Ability Co-op and Vivian Rath is here with me today who is one of the leaders of the Printing House Square Leaders Project and the Disability Service transitions to Printing House Square. There will be rooms named after disabled Trinity graduates that have shown great examples of leadership and activism. So Vivian, how are you today? I'm absolutely great Courtney and I'm really delighted to be speaking to you today. Uh, a great uh, disability activist you are yourself. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to having our chat. Uh, so Vivian, uh, you have studied in UCD and Trinity. Could you tell me about that experience and a bit about yourself and what was it like to navigate both campuses as a student with a disability? Okay, uh, well, I'm, uh, I, I, yes, as you said, I went to University College Dublin first where I studied uh, pharmacology uh, and uh, that I, I was actually a first in family uh, to go to college and also I was uh, the first and only person uh, that year to go to in my school to go to university uh, that, uh, and uh, that uh, of course I also had a significant physical disability and what I actually didn't know at that time and I know now is that I was part of only less than one percent uh, of students with disabilities in higher education at that time. There was very few disabled students attending college. Um, of course, I didn't know that, but uh, during my first year in college, I, I certainly had a, a quite an isolating experience. And that, that was for a combination of, of uh, factors, uh, my disability, and I was unwell for some time. Uh, also, I, was, uh, I happened to be living with people who are much older than I. Uh, but then on top of all of that, I faced a lot of barriers on the campus, which at that time was, was quite inaccessible uh, and made it very difficult. And of course, then I was studying pharmacology, which was a very, uh, or science at that time, uh, which was a very demanding course and uh, that it required a, a lot of hours in the lab and uh, adaptations. But it was in second year then uh, that things really, my second year, that things really took off for me, uh, that uh, I was living on campus, uh, I was living with my brother, uh, who had just started college, and we lived together with a, a, a man from Mayo uh, who was blind. And really, that, that living together uh, with people my own age, uh, and a, a disabled person as well, really opened up my world. Uh, that uh, we drank a lot of tea together, we partied a lot together, but also we lived, loved and learned together. Uh, and it was during that time then that I really started to get involved in college life. And so I got to know uh, the people on campus around me and we worked together uh, to establish a small group uh, called the IPA, which was the Inclusion, Participation and Awareness Society. And uh, that the reason we, we set that up was because we wanted to be more involved in campus life. Uh, in actual fact, we wanted to play sports, uh, we wanted to debate more, but in order to do that, uh, that we, we needed to remove the, work to remove the barriers that existed at that time. So in actual fact, we went on to set up a wheelchair basketball team. Uh, and the great thing about wheelchair basketball is that it was a combination of both uh, disabled people and people without disabilities who could play together and compete together on a what was a level playing pitch. Uh, and uh, that, that really grew. And in actual fact, at that time, it was the first and only third level wheelchair basketball team uh, in, in, on the campus. So yeah, what, I mean, my, from that, what happened really was that the barriers that had existed for me in first year, those barriers like inaccessible campus, uh, inaccessible lecture theatres, they actually didn't seem to be as bad uh, as, as they were. And I think that was because I now had this big group of friends around me uh, who I could talk to about it, uh, share uh, my experiences, both positive and negative, and get to know each other. Um, and yeah, I went on then actually to, to, to kind of fast forward. I was uh, elected the um, Students' Union Vice President and Welfare Officer. Uh, and at that time, again, there was no significant, uh, well, there wasn't very many 
people with significant disabilities being elected to those posts. Uh, so it was a great step in terms of having a disabled person at the decision-making table within the college. Uh, and I think that was really important. Uh, but yes, you mentioned then, uh, I, I worked in college then for a while afterwards. And then I decided to do um, a PhD in Trinity uh, College Dublin. So uh, that was a very different experience for, for a number of reasons, Courtney, because I think firstly, you know, I was, I was older, uh, that I had been through my undergraduate and my master's, and that um, I, I think as well that it, it, I was really focused as well on what I wanted to research. Um, the experience in Trinity was, was different. The campus had become more accessible, although there are still some barriers within the college. Um, but also as well that it, it was a smaller group um, and there was more disabled people as well in college, which again was really, really helpful because in the School of Education, uh, I could talk to them about my experiences or the challenges I was facing in the first years of my PhD. Uh, so yeah, that uh, in many respects, my experience has been different and what I've seen over those years is that there has been, certainly has been improvements uh, within the higher education environment. Uh, but I still think there is a lot to be done uh, in terms of that. I think did that answer some of your question? I uh, know that definitely does. And it's interesting to hear like the difference, obviously, because you did your undergrad in UCD and PhD in Trinity and the wheelchair basketball and the society and like, as I said, I'm part of the Billy Co-op. So I do see very sim they are very similar in ways and did you find from that that there did you see much um much more engagement of people students with disabilities getting involved in areas on campus with Certainly. from the group uh, yeah abs absolutely uh, that what, what i found was that we we all got to know each other but it wasn't a case of just disabled people uh, in in one group this was a group for everybody, there was people with disabilities and people without disabilities, and they were all our friends, and they were all very supportive. But I think a key part of that group was actually, it was fun. It wasn't always about the serious campaigning uh, and raising issues and barriers. We also had held quizzes. Uh, as I said, we played teacher basketball. We had parties, and uh, we went for tea. We had, went for a pint in the student bar. And um, those aspects are very important as well, because I think it's some people would feel that if you're a disabled student in college, maybe you might feel, oh, well, I have to campaign for this and I have that campaign for that. You're also expected to have some fun and get to know people. And I think that's a really critical aspect. And I think that's why our IPA group was, was really successful at the time. And I got to know some fantastic disabled people. Um, and and everybody else as well, of course. But I actually, before coming to college, I actually didn't know very many other disabled people. Uh, I perhaps one or two in my secondary school, uh, but other than that, uh, I actually didn't know. And I and I hadn't much experience in talking to to other disabled people about my experience and sharing my experience. And that's why it was so great living with my brother Paddy uh, at that time. And also our very, very good friend, Tomas Langan uh, from Mayo, and Tomas was blind. Tomas was the first blind person I'd ever met uh, when, I went, uh, when I went to college. So that, uh, and he opened up, uh, he, I mean, he opened up my eyes to his experience and shared his experience. And that really, that was really the learning that happened for me. And I've always said this, that even though I'm a disability rights activist and I have been now for years, I don't know everything about disability. I know a lot about my own disability, but I don't know everything about disability. So I think that is the thing that I learned most about the community college, is that to, to, to speak to other people, to find out about their experiences, uh, and I'm not talking about just people with disabilities, I'm talking about everybody. Uh, and so yeah, that, that was one of my biggest learnings uh, while serving in college. Yeah, no, you're definitely right. Like for me as well, coming into college, like I obviously knew a lot about 
hearing loss and hearing aids and cochlear implants, sign language interpreters, all that. But in terms of like even working for the disability service for the summer, I was working with a lot of students with autism, which I actually wouldn't have known that much about that. And I feel like I definitely have a lot more knowledge and just even having conversations about that with them, like what they struggle with, you know, and just like what they enjoy and just them as a person. Like it's great. It's a great experience just, you know, learning that in college while even just doing your academic stuff. You're, when you get to know people, you understand different, you know, even different there's loads of like international students in college as well so you get to hear about all different cultures and all different you know what way that they were brought up and so it's so interesting that you have that kind of experience in college and yeah so this kind of leads me into a question about your PhD so you are research researching the social involvement of students with disabilities in higher education which sounds very very interesting if you I would want to say, like, what has in, what inspired you to research this topic? Well, as we've just discussed, my experiences as an undergraduate, I think that had a major uh, part to play uh, in my interest in researching this topic. Because although I highlighted many of the positives uh, of my experience, there were a lot of negatives as well. And although I was lucky and also worked at it and managed to gather a group around me uh, who supported me and we had fun and we had learned a lot. Um, there were a lot of students on campus uh, and those off campus with disabilities who did not get that opportunity to socially engage in the way that I and my friends did. Uh, and we, we all noted that at that time. And it was it was often because of inaccessible venues, it was because, maybe because they had no PA services for the, in the evenings, uh, that perhaps maybe they couldn't get into campus. And so that always stuck with me, the fact that there was a group of students who were missing out on this. And that, uh, so after I, I did a master's in uh, Smurfit in business management, and I studied, uh, I did my dissertation on the employment of graduates with disabilities. And one of the things that came to light in that was the impact, uh, the negative impact in terms of employment of not having those, that social engagement part on your CV. All the things maybe like auditor of a society or organizer of the ability co-op or aspects like that that can make a huge contribution. And um, so with, with that in mind, and also my experience as an undergraduate, uh, I really wanted, for a very long time, have wanted to investigate the social engagement experiences of disabled students. Um, and you see, Courtney, social engagement is really important. Um, but the focus has been on just getting disabled students into college, because there wasn't very many in college at the time. And so there, uh, there has been a lesser focus then on what is their social engagement experiences like when they get into college. So uh, that uh, social engagement contributes uh, to your sense of belonging. And the sense of belonging, that feeling of being part of the community that you're cared for, loved within the community, actually results in better grades. Uh, it results in you wanting to stay in college. Uh, and that it also results in a, in a, a, a better college climate as well. So. I, I, that's all the, the research. So that's, those are the reasons why I decided to investigate it. And of course, the other fact is there is no research on the social engagement experiences of disabled students in higher education in Ireland published at the moment. Uh, so yeah, so that's, that's my, my drive to do it. I'm excited to uh, read about it because uh, I do think about it myself that like, you are right that it is kind of like, oh, they've got into college now that's it but like yeah it, the social aspect of getting involved is so important and it is like like I found like getting involved in like say you know the sign language society and the students union like just having it a bit separate from academic stuff I was able to focus like because I had a break from academic stuff by getting involved but I do get the whole kind of barrier that you know 
like I know that I have to say work harder than some students in my lectures because I can't hear uh so that takes up a bit of time and then I could just be like oh I don't want to get involved now because I'm focusing all my time there so I could see how that could be an issue and I really do hope that there is like more engagement from students with disabilities to get involved in uh stuff on campus so like that's what we'd really want the ability co-op to like encourage students to do the do that to do that like if they if somebody emailed me and was like I want to get involved in somewhere I would try and set them up and get them ready to go for it because sometimes you do need that bit of a push or guidance so um that is such a, like an interesting topic to have researched and um Vivian uh, how have you found the experience of campaigning for greater participation of people with disabilities in public and political life? Courtney I have to say I've, I've found it challenging over the years and uh, that uh, it, it when I was when I've been in well for instance when I was in my undergraduate initially it was quite tough uh, but once I got people on board and once people understood uh, they really came behind me uh, and worked uh, to, to achieve those goals. Uh, however, once I got into, into the wider society, I again have faced those similar challenges. And many disability rights activists can actually find it quite exhausting uh, at times and, and very frustrating. And that what is, what is difficult is that we, as disability rights activists, seem to be constantly and still campaigning for access, access uh, to buildings, ensuring that lifts are working, uh, to ensure that there's a wheelchair ramp. And it really seems very frustrating, but also ridiculous in some respects, that in this day and age, when we have so much legislation, uh, uh, such as the Disability Act 2005, uh, the Equal Status Act, and of course, now we've ratified the United Nations Convention on the rights of persons with disabilities, that here we are still fighting just to get into the building. Uh, and, but even at a wider sphere, that if that means that it takes away from what we probably should be campaigning for and working hard on is to ensure that disabled people are at the decision-making table, which is really important. We should have more disabled people who are in the doll. We should have more disabled people in the Senate. We should have more disabled people in all decision-making positions, especially those that relate a concern to them. So I, in terms of your question, yes, it is very challenging, but what it is great and what I, ha what I have found great is that that sense of community that I have found has developed as a true social media. Uh, say Facebook or Twitter, and that uh, it, it's been really nice to be able to interact uh, with disability rights campaigners all over the world uh, about their experiences and, and our experiences here in Ireland. Uh, we still have quite a long way to go. Uh, employment of disabled people is still very low. And that uh, I would, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful for the future that with the United Nations Convention, that we will we will see more disabled people at the decision making table and resulting in greater changes yeah i hope that there will be because uh yeah like as you're saying like you're literally fighting for to have like a ramp to be in that decision making and it's that would be very very frustrating and it's still shocking that that's still a thing like even say Trinity for example there is like a few students uh, students with uh, that have wheelchairs and uh, you know they would obviously be can't go to a class if there's the lifts break and they're apparently the lifts kind of break a bit uh, regularly which uh, is terrible that they have to be the ones to email and be frustrated when there should be like regularly made, like checked by the staff to make sure everything's in proper order for all their students to use so it's ridiculous that has to that's the way things are and hopefully will change <laughs> but what, one interesting thing is that whilst i was studying for my uh, for my phd in the college uh, in trinity uh, that i uh, went to host an event uh, in 2018 on the public and political participation of disabled people 
uh, and it was very difficult to get an accessible venue to accommodate uh, all the people that wanted to attend, disabled people who wanted to attend. But not only that, to actually find a stage that was accessible and allowed disabled speakers to speak. And I think that is a, you know, a sign in itself uh, that we don't expect them. There is a kind of expectation in society that they you know, are not going to be up there. Um, and I was delighted today, actually, I opened and launched an accessible lift, stair lift for a stage in Enniscorthy County Wexford in the presentation centre. Um, so, which, which is great, but the important thing is that it's not only about the lift or the ramp, it's also about the support and the opportunity to do it. Uh, so, I mean, again, access without support is not opportunity. And, and I think we need, yeah, we need to do a lot of work on that uh, to ensure that disabled people have the opportunity to do it and that we, we disability proof uh, our processes and our procedures to do that. And I think, again, and I've said this, especially because we're talking about college and ability crop and all, it's all about fun. I mean, life is about having some fun. And if you can't get out and enjoy yourself and meet your friends, without having to worry about barriers or having to worry about, can I get into the restaurant? Well, it makes it very difficult. And, we, and I think if COVID has taught us anything, uh, the general, especially the general population, is that how important those little meetups are. Yet disabled people have been facing those barriers all the time. And so uh, that, uh, again, it is really, really important, I think, that we start looking towards those, and we look at looking towards this, as an, and looking and saying, well, what opportunities are now here to ensure that disabled people have greater engagement, and especially social engagement. Yeah, no, that's uh, yeah, very true. Like ev like everything with COVID, the actual just meetups with your friends and stuff like that is like so so important and. The lack of like, especially in Dublin, like most places have like a step up to a restaurant or their back entrance is just like nowhere to be found. There's not really any signage and there are things that need to be, you know, changed and focused on and it shouldn't be just, oh, it's, it seems like a bit of a mess. So hopefully things do get better. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I have another question. Uh, so you are a member of the Disability Advisory Committee by the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. How have you found this experience? Yes, absolutely. I, I'm a member of the Disability Advisory Committee, and which has a statutory role in the monitoring of the United Nations Convention on Rights of Persons with Disability. Uh, I have absolutely loved that role. Um, again, I, I have learned so much uh, that uh, there are a group of disability activists from all over the country uh, with a range of experience, personal experiences, but a huge amount of knowledge. And that uh, it, from that, I have learned a huge amount. And that uh, I can actually then bring that experience and that learning to the, to the campaigns that I run are the, um, in terms of the maybe reports that I'm doing, uh, are just my work in terms of activism and in promoting the rights of disabled people. What has been really eye-opening for me as well is that the sense of confidence it gives you to look around the room and see other really able capable disabled people who were making points, arguing, discussing, but they're involved in the process. They are there, they have a role, and I have a role in monitoring the CRPD uh, and its implementation in Ireland. And that it, it is also great to be able to bring feedback from people I know within my community to that table, to see that being processed and actually then going forward and being used and to make change happen. And for me, that's what was really, and it was really beneficial and has acted actually to 
instill far greater confidence in me. And that's why I really would love to see other disabled people having that opportunity. Uh, and I think that's why a bit, the groups like the Ability Co-op are really great because to, in order to enable you, say for instance, Courtney, to prepare yourself, to skill yourself, to sit on committees like the UN, the, the, the Disability Advisory Committee, or other you know, senior leadership boards, you need to gain experience. And the only way you can gain experience is at, from every level. You have to work your way up to the level. And I think that's really useful. And I think a lot of disabled people don't get that opportunity because the, the well, for instance, there are lots of barriers, like maybe if, you, if you're a part of a small group, then you mightn't have access to sign language interpreting. Uh, there, you, again, the building might be inaccessible. Uh, that, or there simply might not be a group. And those, that means disabled people don't get that opportunity. They don't get to develop the skills. And then it's very challenging to get to the next level uh, and to be able to contribute and to have the skills to contribute uh, where it's really needed and, and to hear that voice. So in terms of the, the Disability Advisory Committee, it's been a fantastic experience. I think we are making a, a, a good, a good, great contribution uh, and uh, that uh, I've certainly enjoyed it. Sounds like, it sounds great. And have you had any uh, meetings or just talking with the other members like online? Because I know with like the co-op, like we all started online and we all basically haven't met each other before, but we all have different disabilities and we all just kind of went for it. And as you were saying that there isn't that much opportunity or they might not get the opportunity to, you know, build up to go for these roles because you know and I hope that the co-op does provide that but opportunities especially in terms of like teamwork and just having a lot more information about other disabilities or what issues that are at hand so uh, would you say that um, the committee would uh, will maybe continue their meetings online? Oh yes well um, I've, Courtney I have actually been a great fan of online meetings uh, before COVID, and uh, because of my disability, uh, I also uh, suffer from chronic illness, uh, chronic asthma, uh, and as a result, I could get a flare-up of asthma and be actually uh, housebound, maybe for you know maybe a month or two months, uh, or sometimes I could be in hospital for three months. And so I found that the only way for me to be able to continue to contribute uh, and to engage with the wider community was actually to really embrace uh, social media, but also online meetings. So in actual fact, I had uh, sought online meetings with uh, the Disability Advisory Committee, the National Disability Stakeholders Group, the National Disability Inclusion Strategy Group, long before COVID. Uh, and so they, they, these groups facilitated that. Uh, and, has, and that has allowed me to continue to contribute even when uh, maybe I can't leave the house or when I'm unwell. And uh, so, yeah, I, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't continue. My preference, I have to say, is actually face-to-face. -face. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very uh, outgoing and uh, enjoy conversation, enjoy people. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, in times when I'm not well, uh, that uh, this, this really offers uh, an opportunity. And... What's really interesting, Courtney, I mentioned to you at the start about the low levels of employment for disabled people. I think uh, remote working uh, really can offer opportunities uh, for disabled people to, to work and to manage their disability um, and to have that flexibility uh, that it allows. And for me, it certainly has, has, has given me that opportunity. And in actual fact, I have actually been engaging more with the college now uh, than I was before COVID, uh, which is really interesting because of the remote working, the social media aspect. Uh, and yeah, so it's been, it's been great. Yeah, no, I see like, um, like at the start, we had uh, 
asked a few people with disabilities what they thought about uh, the online world and how that's working and a lot of them were in favour of it because before you know they might have had uh, appointments that they couldn't make it to class so they were doing part-time and now that they're seeing the college has reacted very quickly to uh, moving everything online that they should have had this in consideration before for students with disabilities. So uh, it's been kind of like that. So uh, hopefully that they will consider that. And as you're saying, like low uh, opportunities for employment, that there could be like the work from home uh, alternative, which would work wonders. And work, working from home, see it is like, like I've been working at home for the disability intern role and it's worked perfectly. For me anyway and I was thought oh if there's no subtitles I might struggle but it really does there really has been ways to uh, uh, you know accommodate for that and few uh, you know platforms well Zoom actually doesn't have captioning so hopefully it will soon but uh, there's a few other ones like Microsoft Teams and stuff like that so I hope that you know the online world and people do take that in consideration for you know job opportunities or you know new college courses and yes, yeah, so this leads me on to my next but, question. You know, can I just, Courtney, can I just oh, add one on? Yeah. I think there's also another side to it, uh, which we need to consider. And this is the point which I'm a little worried about. And that is that some may consider remote working uh, for disabled people as substitute for not improving access to uh, transport, uh, to parking, uh, to buildings, uh, and that uh, I'm also concerned as well that not having disabled people out in the community uh, with non-disabled people will result in less awareness of disability yep. and the issues around disability. And the nature I have found, my experience is that by people seeing me out and about, doing things in maybe leadership roles uh, actually results in greater awareness and it really normalizes disability uh, and uh, there's a greater acceptance and, and understanding uh, and so I would be a little worried that in some areas that maybe for instance government might consider well okay sure he can work from home uh, we don't need to make the, uh, the, the bus accessible uh, or, uh, for instance, it, it, similarly for those with chronic illness. And I think uh, that in terms of COVID, and I know we're speaking a lot about that, uh, that we need to, to remember that, that disabled people need to get out and be seen, uh, socially engaged, because we need to protect our mental health as well. Yeah, no, I like when you started saying that, saying that, I was like, that's such a good point, because like, if they do decide, oh, if you're on all online, why are they just going to keep every, all people with disabilities inside and then the ones are not just going around? No, like that's so true. Like you can't, and you're so right, there needs to be more people with disabilities in leadership roles. So there is more awareness, which is very, very true. So I feel like it's kind of like, it doesn't seem like a very win-win situation. It's not like, oh, well, you can, you can, they can get involved by being online, but then you're keeping them at home in that sense so uh hopefully there is some win into that situation soon <laughs> anyway um yes yeah, so uh vivian so we talked about your phd and what is next for you courtney that is a brilliant question uh, <laughs> that's it <laughs> i'm probably going to take a little break for a while uh, that's it the phd journey has been uh, really rewarding and and uh, that's it but it has been a long journey and that it, it took me a little bit longer because I was ill a good bit and spent a lot of time in hospital during the PhD. It's also very demanding. Uh, so I certainly would be factoring in some type of little break in there and maybe an opportunity to get out and about and do things that maybe I haven't been able to do for the last couple of years. However, I'm also very interested in continuing and my research, uh, especially in the areas of the social engagement of disabled students uh, in leadership, uh, in the areas of diversity and inclusion. So I'm very interested in doing that, especially in light of the fact 
that there is very little research uh, and work on this. Uh, what I have learned, Courtney, and I'm sure you also have learned this over the last in your time in the ability co op, is that if you want to make change happen, you also need to be able to back it up uh, with some figures or some data or some information. And uh, critical to all of that is the lived experience of disabled people. And that's what I'm very much interested in doing, is hearing more of the lived experience of disabled people and bringing that forward uh, and working with disabled people then to make change happen. So I guess I continue certainly with my disability rights activist hat on, uh, and I will certainly go for, uh, to look towards more research and work in that area. But I've also been involved in the Trinity Centre for People with Intellectual Disabilities in a teaching capacity. And I really enjoyed that as well. And it, I teach on the disability rights module uh, in the centre. Uh, and I actually teach the module uh, with two other disabled people. Uh, one of them, uh, Dr. Patricia McCarthy uh, and Jess Mannion. And that then there are a, a number of disabled students in the class. And I found it personally very rewarding to be able to talk to young disabled people uh, and to assist, to empower them to, to, to prepare themselves for the world and to activate their voice uh, and to speak up for their rights because I think that's absolutely critical. Uh, that it, it, you know, and it can be very draining at times having to constantly speak up for yourself. For, uh, but it is also very important and I think there is ways of doing it uh, in order to achieve what you want. So yes, research and uh, continuing disability rights. That's great, Vivian, and definitely take that uh, well-deserved break after the, the PhD. And yeah, so this is the final question. Uh, so what advice or words of encouragement would you have for students with disabilities who may feel discouraged that they will succeed outside of college because of their disability? I think that is a very good question. And uh, it's a question that I often probably ask myself because as a disabled person, you're going to face constant challenges, uh, some less than others, some more than others, uh, that, uh, and depending on the environment you're in. However, I would say to disabled people, disabled student, getting ready to leave college. Remember, disabled people are excellent problem solvers. Disabled people have a set of skills which many people don't have. And that, that is problem solving. And that is extremely useful when it comes to the working environment. I think it's also important to avail of the supports that are on offer in the environment around you. So for instance, um, the Association for Higher Education, Access and Disability have a great range of supports, especially around employment. I think a very important point to remember as well is that getting a job or gaining employment is actually is challenging for everybody. Yes, it can be more challenging for some disabled people, but I wouldn't be disheartened by that. I think it's important that you rem rem remember that, as I said, you have great problem solving skills, but also have confidence in your own ability and that you need to work on that. And I think one aspect of that, of course, is disclosure of a disability. And that can be really difficult. For me, it's not so difficult because my disability is really obvious. Um, but that can, that can have its own problems when you go into an interview uh, because you, it, 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 creates, uh, it might create some anxiety with your employer. So the important thing is to develop the skills to know what you're going to do in those situations and around disclosure of a disability. But I think the most important thing is to remember if you have the confidence, you've got the skills, you are great, and you are going to get that job. That's, that is brilliant advice. And yeah, I know I say uh, loads of people who watch this, this video will be up on, well, when the Printing House Square is up and running, hopefully for next year. And yeah, that uh, 
I was talking to someone else, uh, Beth and Collins, about uh, about um, interviews and stuff like that. And like Declan would uh, often say, you know, uh, you know, there's so many people maybe just coming in from college, but you having a disability and you having say that difference or that experience. And as you said, problem solving, like they're just extra skills that like do also kind of look well on, you know, for a job interview. And I think that that's even like my advice. I would say that like I, I'm not out of college yet, but I would hope that if there is a, that I never date myself for my hearing loss, that I can't do something. And I hope other students with disabilities also don't date themselves because they can do it. And as you did say, they are problem solvers so uh that is that is great advice and thank you vivian for talking to me today and it's a pleasure to have you as one of the leaders of the Printed Night square leadership project no problem courtney it's been a pleasure talking to you too and you've been doing great work in the ability co-op and keep it up and to all of the people uh, that will be listening i i'd say to you that uh, make make sure you have your voice heard that is very important. Uh, that uh, you're a valued part of the community, just like I am, and uh, that uh, you can bring change about if you want to. Thank you. Okay. Bye.